What disagreement I had this morning with my wife? Is my shirt green? No. No. No, it's blue. It's green. It's green. Just in case, this is how marriage works. I wore green socks. So husbands, just so you think about it, usually our wives are right. I'm sure she told me. I'm walking out and she goes, that's not even green. I'm all, woman, you don't call a man out on his green. What is up with him? She ignored me, didn't care. But anyway, it is good to be with you. But I do ask that you pray. And I say that, that I'm telling you. I mean, obviously, you guys watch the news, and depending on where you hit, where you slant, where you whatever, we, we forget these are people that Jesus died for. That's right. And, and, and with that said, um, we don't know how long any of these guys were with us. Some are getting older, and, and that's in the news as well. But that just means they might be closer to that graduation. Yeah. And I'll tell you, um, that matters to me. It's a ministry, it's a mission field that I get to be a part of. And so uh, maybe if it's hard for you to pray for them, which shouldn't be, but if it is, maybe pray for me as I get to hang out with some of them. Uh, just a thought. Yes. So this last period of weeks, we've had an ongoing conversation about flesh versus the spirit. Now, it, it, is, it is really where the battle is. And if you, if you really put too much effort into the battle that happens right in front of your face, um, the Bible is very clear that it's what's unseen that's eternal. And I just challenge you that this is a crucial conversation for Christians. And, and, and part of it, and I'll just be truthfully honest with you today, today I'm, I'm battling a little bit. I'm a little bit weak on my left side. You might say, hey, you look so tired today. I am tired. I just got back from D.C. I was walking a lot and doing a lot and meeting a lot. However, that's, that's the flesh, doing whatever the flesh does. And, and But my spirit is, is 100% here and excited to share with you what God's doing. And, and as we submit to him, there's a real battleground that goes on. And we have, always have excuses of why we can't, shan't, shouldn't do something. But when it comes to serving God and following him, it's not about you or me. It's about what he's asking. It's a place where the decisions are made. It's about who will serve, how will serve, who will value, how will value them, who will represent. If you walked into any particular room, I guarantee you'll have your preconceived ideas and you'll decide who you'd like to value. How many of you are Christian men or women in this house today? I hope, raise your hand, be proud. I want you to know if you truly believe that and you've given your life to Christ, then what you think doesn't matter anymore. Right. And so what we're talking about today, when we talk about value, we talk about spiritually living, it has to do with submitting our thoughts and our, our ways and our attitudes to Christ and saying, God, what would you have me do? That's the, that's the battle we're talking about here. We're talking about submitting to something that's far greater than yourself, and it doesn't matter the circumstance, because what we tend to do, and we'll get into this, we tend to say, but if you knew what that person and if you only understood the situation, but didn't you see the news, but didn't you? Yeah, none of that matters. That's a battle for something. I'm talking about you. How are you going to treat people? How are you going to act? How are you going to function? So today I'm going to give you a tool that will help you determine who's winning. Is your flesh winning? Or is your spirit winning? Because I know that we've had incredible teachings happening, talking about all kinds of things about flesh and, you know, the fight back and forth and how it goes. But this is a tool that I think will help you. It helps me. Matter of fact, since I knew God wanted me to teach on this for the last three weeks, it has been rough trying to live this teaching out. I'm not kidding. I, I, I'm all. Sometimes I'm like grumpy and my wife wants me to do something. I'm all. I don't want it. No. And then what this teaching comes in mind, I'm all. Oh. <laughs> How do I live this out? She's going to hear me preach this a few minutes, you know, and I'm going to have to live this out. And so, but I want to talk about this tool and hopefully you get to take this home. I hope you, you, you really apply this. There are uh, up here, you're going to find there's homework to take home, but I hope you put this on your bathroom sink, somewhere where you look at it, because it's going to ask you a question. It's going to ask you a question that's important. I believe the word we're going to talk about, it really is a decision you're going to make. It gives accountability, it asks a question, and it gives you purpose. I think the word is scary to live by. And that word is generous. 
Now that might be weird. You're like, what? He just tricked me. That's not that great of a word. No, let's talk about that. What does this word generous mean? Man. Tell you now, if you work the idea of generosity, sometimes people give for all different reasons, so purpose matters. Some people are generous because they, you know, I, I read a thing of, you know, Steve Jobs is the most generous man on earth. Well, truthfully, he's not. I say that because just because he gives away more money than others, that doesn't mean he's more generous. He has a lot of extra and you can give away a lot. The Bible talks about many people who didn't have much and gave what they had. They're the most generous people you'll ever find because they gave out of what they didn't have. They gave out of their lacking and they gave out of something much bigger. And so when we talk about this word generous, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about what does Christ require and why does this have anything to do with being spiritual? So you might not be convinced this is that important yet, but I think by the time we're done, you'll see the generosity of living out a, a, a spirit-filled life. And it, it, it is a litmus test to knowing if you're walking in the spirit or walking in the flesh. And if you're walking in the spirit, you're gonna find that a lot of things line up a lot easier. Now, it's important that we look at it as we look at this, as we're not talking about the idea of comparing yourself to somebody else. So the next question I wanna ask here, if you go to the next slide, is I, am I generous? Now, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll come over here and I'll stand next to Tim and I'll say, well, I gave a bigger tip than she did. That makes me, what, call me it, generous. You know, I'm a cheap tipper, what are you thinking? What? You know, I can say, we, we do that, right? Come on, that's how we kind of gauge how we're generous. Because we, we compare ourselves to somebody else's story. But I want to tell you the kind of litmus test I'm talking about is that you forget anybody else in the room, but we serve for an audience of one, and we say, Jesus, what did you do in my story? And in my story, am I reciprocal to what you gave me? Hmm. Yeah. And, you, and this isn't what my idea. I'm not, I'm not that wise. I just read the Bible. I'm about to in a minute give you some of his stories. And you're going to see where Jesus, what I'm telling you is what Jesus is talking about. But a lot of times be careful because you might think you're generous because you tithe or you give or you've been done this or you go volunteer somewhere. That's great. Woo, good job. Keep doing it. You're all good things. But I'll tell you what, if you are seeking God, you're going to find that generosity gets more and more difficult as we talk about some of the things that become that this generous effects. Now I want to tell you the bottom line is that Jesus expects generosity in every area of life. Not because it's a hoop you jump through to find him. It's because of what he did for you. Yeah. Now it's important you get that because some people give and give and give and give and they do it for different reasons. But what have we been giving? We just sang a song. Remember, I saw some gifts. We're like, amazing grace. You sounded better than I did, but yeah, right? How sweet the sound, the saved a wretch like me. Do we believe this? I'm going to be tricking you here in a minute because I'm really getting you online. Do you believe this? Yes. I do. And I once was lost. I still get lost because I'm kind of slow that way. And now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I was Christopher, and sometimes Jesus shows up inside of me and said, Christopher, this is a big deal. Or, go to the next slide, have I forgotten that, that I'm the one with the hammer in my hand? That's me. I put Jesus on the cross. And now I'm put him there, I kept him there. You know that Jesus, when he walked this earth, he didn't have to go on the cross. He came and he gave away his life. He wasn't taken from him. He could have got down any time, but he stayed because of my sin. Now, that's the wretch we are. That's the Bible. That's the gospel. That's the good news that the Jesus came in and brought. We are not somehow better than anyone, but instead we're just one beggar telling another beggar where we can find some bread. Now, remember that. And I say this, this is crucial. Because so many times we as Christians, we almost like God comes and props us up and saves us from our mess. We get baptized and we die to ourselves and live for him. And then we walk in a room and I'm better than all of you. But I'm not. 
I'm just the guy that Jesus saved. And you know what the rest of my life gets to be about? Helping you see him. Yes. That's what I get to do. No matter what job you have, I don't care what title you have or don't have, that's not going to change anything. If you're not willing to serve him and work for him and, and lay down your life for him, this doesn't mean much. I mean, I'm not saying you don't go to heaven. That's between you and him. I am not the judge of any of that. But I'm saying, while we're here on this earth, if God's not going to use me, take me now. I just keep messing it up. But I think I have a purpose, which means me falling down, getting back up, running after him, getting up, for doing all that's worth it. Now, some of you still don't believe me this is that important, but I'm going to tell you some Jesus words here in a minute and tell you a story. So I have a few actors who are going to help me. So this is a great litmus test of spiritual living. Out of Matthew 18. Now, I'm not going to read this portion of scripture. I'm going to tell the story. We'll read a little more scripture in a few minutes. But this is out of Matthew 18. You can follow the Bible if you'd like or go back and read it later. So this was a time when Peter and Jesus were having a conversation about forgiveness. Now, Peter wants to know how many times do I actually have to forgive somebody? Now, knowing the character of Peter, that's really what he wants to know. I'm just going to do as much as I have to. If it's 490 times, 70 times 7, then I'm good. Then I know, I, you know, you can punch me in the face that many times, and then I'm going to punch you right back. You watch 491, we're done for, right? That's what, that's what he's talking about. So Jesus tells the story. And he talks about that there's this king. Well, this time we're, we're going to use, Emma, you want to come on up? We're going to use a queen because my wife has a tiara. Why my wife has a tiara? That's something you can talk to her about, but she really does. So there you go. We have queen. Thank you, Queen Emma. Okay. Now, Queen Emma is awesome, but she owns everything. She's like the queen, man. And, and, and so there's this person who has debt. And I'm going to ask my friend Jason. Now, Jason, you don't know yet. Some of you, he's newer to the church. But I've known Jason since I was a child. Come on up, brother. Truth, we grew up together. Our families did. And he just, I just found out that he was in town. And so I'm going to use him. <laughs> it's not good to be friends with me, by the way. You can ask other friends I have here. It's not good. No. So this is, this is going to be our guy that, that really owes the queen a lot of money. Now, let me talk about this. Because he paints this picture for him that he understands so clearly. And, and he wants to make it clear how generous the queen is going to be. Now, he's talking about God, God being whatever. So, so he came, the queen was ready, said, oh, counts. This person owed not just a little bit of money, but verse 24 tells us he owed him 10,000 bags of gold or talents, depending on which we know. Now, now, talent, gold, whatever, it's about 75 pounds is what they would believe that would be. One talent. So if you're wondering what that is, it equals to that of gold. How many of you have a talent of gold? And I want to know you. Personally, I'm running for office right now. I'm just kidding. I'm just, a, but I'm just saying, we, we have a lot we can talk about if you have 10,000 bags of gold. Now, this was back then. So how much do you think that might be now? That's a lot. They actually say, I mean, I kind of did some math here. If you go to the next slide, I went on and I tried to find some, some things here. You mind bumping to the next slide? There you go. So, talent. 200,000 years of labor is what they say it was. 10,000, that, that's, that's what we're talking. So this is kind of interesting to see, and so that's what you owe, okay? You, the queen, come, come up here, because you're mighty. This guy, Jason, I can't believe he's in that kind of debt. Anybody else in that here? How many of you owe 10,000 bags of gold? You're doing better than Jason. <laughs> Oops, I'm throwing my pen away. So, and, and so she comes and says, give me my money. Show me the money. Show me the money. There you go. <laughs> and what do you do? <laughs> well, if you don't have the money, then we're going to throw you in jail, take your family, do all that stuff. And so, so literally the Bible says, so the servant comes down and begs. You don't have to beg too hard, but just... You know, kind of get the picture. I want you to get this picture because this is us. This is us. If you don't realize this is us, and now this this gold what it represents, it's infinity. It's more gold than anybody had ever seen. They they don't have this kind of money. So obviously that's a debt you can never pay. 
And, and then you beg for forgiveness, and you say, have mercy and grace. And guess what? Queen Emma does show up. Go ahead, give, give grace and mercy however. <laughs> <laughs> I just tell, hey, oh, oh, help! Yeah. <laughs> you own a uh, car. Do you own a, ha- oh, own a house right now? Do you own a car that you're still paying on? What if no. I just, <laughs> do you have any debt? No. Oh, check you out. <laughs> what, imagine, uh, who owns a house in here right now and has a mortgage? What if today I said you don't have a mortgage anymore? <laughs> so that response? <laughs> That's the kind of, I'm expecting a big response. So he, he, he has that. Now, Greg, will you come up? I have another actor here who's going to join me. Greg's a dear friend, pastor, chaplain, and all those good things. Now, Greg has a problem that he has debt too. Now, his debt's more, more real. It's about a four months wage, if you're wondering. And he owes Jason. Okay, he owes Jason this money. So he's over here, minding his own business, doing whatever, saying, I'm hanging out. Jason just got freedom of his debt. And then you go over to Greg, and you're going to demand him. Now, the Bible says he went up and started choking him. Now, I didn't tell Greg this when I asked him. <laughs> he didn't know he was getting choked. I don't really choke him, because I like him. But he's going to go and demand this money from him. Four months wages is actually something you can pay off. Go ahead, get it. Get it. Get it. Get it. Get it. Go on, take his wallet. Get him. <laughs> now, the queen hears about this. Give me that. Oh. <laughs> the queen hears about this. Oh. <laughs> so come, come on over, queen. Now, <laughs> are you getting the picture? I hope you're getting the picture. Because the queen finds out about this. And what do you think she's going to say to him? How dare you? (laughs) And a few other words. I'm telling you. And then he says, Jesus says, the king, queen, says, take this man. Throw him in jail. Take everything he has. Because he did not show the kind of love and grace that he was just shown. Generosity is expected. It's, it's, it's a response. It should, be, it should be a natural response. Now, how happy is Greg right now? Yeah! <laughs> Give him all hands. Good job. I'm no longer responsible for your CR. Cheers, man. <laughs> Generosity, do you see generosity is expected? It's expected because it's a natural response out of what you saw. We are that person who has a debt you could never pay. You can't jump high enough, you can't give enough. And the fact that we don't turn around and aren't willing to do this, it's very interesting and it tells us something about our spiritual self, the war that's happening. Now let's look at a couple things of generosity. Because I believe generosity is a way of life for a wretch like me that was saved and loved like Christ loved me. Period. That has to do with my possessions. That's an easy one. If that's all it was, that, we could stop there and I think I could actually somehow, I could do that. It has to do with our abilities. It has to do with our time. Our time. It has to do with your finances. Now we're going to get to the more scary stuff. Has to do with your mercy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Your kindness. Mm-hmm. Your forgiveness. I'm gonna say that one again. Your forgiveness. Attitudes. Don't point anybody, but who woke up with an attitude this morning? <laughs> I do. <laughs> I'm just saying it happens. It has to do with doing the dishes. (laughs) Guarding your words. Anything you speak, anything you do, anything you decide. Because Jesus forgave me in a way 
So now the rest of my life, I get to go live out. And it's a great life. It's not a heavy burden. If you submit, it's a difficult conversation to have. Now I can imagine that you can quickly rationalize why God surely is not expecting you to line up to this in all situations. Because you're gonna, I, I know your mind, my mind does it. I did it for the last three weeks as I worked on this. God, you can't mean that person. And God, do you realize what that person did to me? Do you realize who that is? Do you realize how mad that person makes me? See, you might think that sometimes we as pastors are just really nice. I am not that nice. If you know what happened in my mind, it explodes all the time. And, and, and sometimes people get to hear it. If you come at 10 o'clock at night or later, and my filter turns off, and that's kind of a rule. I have friends who come over just for that reason, actually. It's 8 o'clock. They want to know what's going on down there. Come on, I actually say, yeah, but we, it's true. We have friends here that do it. They're like, is it time? Is this filter on? <laughs> and, and it's true, it changes, things change, and it's not good. But there's this stuff. But when we stop and say, I'm gonna live this generous life that says, I will forgive, I will believe the best, I will seek God, it changes everything. But what happens when this person is horrible? What if they're my enemy? What if I deserve to judge them? Don't act like you don't think like that. Come on. We'll say it again because I think we all think like that. What if this person is horrible? They're my enemy. Or they deserve to be judged by me. Or you. Well, it's funny you ask because Jesus talks about this. In Luke chapter 6. It says, but to you who are listening, I say... Catch this. Love your who? Uh-huh. Do good to, to, to who? You guys are preaching an awesome sermon. I'm telling you, just keep going. Bless those who? Pray for those who? Now, how many of you don't like this sermon already? You're like, who let this guy preach? I agree. I don't know. God has a sense of humor, and he keeps putting me up here. But but if, some, if someone slaps you on one cheek, do what? Turn them the other Someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Now I'm gonna pause for a minute here in scripture on this do to others as you would have them do to you. Now I'm gonna talk personal to some people here today, and it's not everybody, but there are some people here who like hanging out with church and like hanging out and being in a Christian atmosphere. Now, I'm not the senior pastor. You can write every letter you want for every mean thing I'm about to say. If you're not accepting God's love and grace, there's no way you're ever going to show grace and love to anybody else. I just talked to someone yesterday about this. You've been in church for years. Not our church, so you're not here. But but their story is the same as so many. We think God can't forgive us for dot, 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 dot. And God's not big enough. But we love the story. So we go to church, we hang out with it, it makes us feel good. But we aren't really sold out to the idea because he can't forgive me. And if you don't think you're valuable, neither is anybody else around you. And you say, oh, no, I love everybody else. It's just me. No, I, I can sit for hours and really convince you you're wrong. Because I believe at that point, if we don't understand the value that God has done, then none of this makes sense. If we don't understand what God did for me, then all of a sudden, truthfully, I'm just manipulating you. I'm being nice to you so I can get what I want because I don't understand value. But if I actually understand that I've been valued and been called and bought by the blood of the Lamb, and I am now made whole because of Him, not because of me. I don't get to walk in a room and look down at you. I don't get to walk into the D.C. and decide who who is or is not. I don't get to stand next to anybody and decide they're not valuable because of what we just say, because of what we just, the story we just saw. Generosity of love, of forgiveness, of believing the best is who we get to be because I am but an ambassador of Christ. 
That's a good amen right there, by the way. <laughs> now, when I say I'm an ambassador of Christ, do you think that means Christopher? I'm talking about you. I'm talking about you, every one of us. If you're not ambassadoring for Christ, what? who are you representing? Amen. I, I, and I'm not here to pick on you. I, I don't follow you around. And, and I'm going to keep reading here in a minute about being the judge. I'm not your judge. So don't worry about it. But I think it doesn't matter. But what Jesus said does. So I don't get to walk in. I mean, believe me, as pastors, we get to hear things that I don't want to know people did and how they, whatever. I, don't want, I lived in Vegas. I pastored in Vegas for 15 years. We'd have people Sunday morning after Saturday night come and tell me things that should never be talked about, especially on Sunday morning right when I'm about to preach. I'm all, thank you for confessing. You're not a Catholic church. You don't have to do that. No, it's... it's <laughs> but believe me, we, we get to carry things in, and, and you know, I, I, they're valuable. Yeah. What they've done, they don't get to disqualify themselves from the love of God. Let's keep reading. Verse 32. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. We'll read it again because we're kind of back in that vein of Jesus saying things we don't like. <laughs> if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? <laughs> Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? This is that manipulation, that using each other. We're just using each other. What good is that? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. <clears throat> what we just say there? Yeah. Uh huh. You know, so we've done mission works all over the world <laughs> in my little life, and I love places I got to go. There's this one place we took, uh, and I had my greatest team of missionary leaders. We went down into this one place, and it doesn't matter where, I don't want to say where, it just says, I'm not trying to put judgment on them. But when we went in, we weren't received very well. And I watched these giants of people, men and women, who served with me all over the world, tell me they don't want to be there anymore because these people didn't treat them very nice. I was beside myself. Now, you might say, well, of course, they didn't treat you very well. No, I was beside myself because my leaders who went over the world had no idea why we were there. We're not there, so these people come by us, so they come and give us a hug, and they tell me how great we are. We're there to be ambassadors to Christ, even in the most difficult times. Even when you don't love what I have to say. Even when you say that guy is nuts. Even I, I'm going to stand and serve for Christ. And if we don't get that, then the fear and stuff that Dan talks about of one day, you guys, we're in trouble. We better be able to stand for what's true and right in the most deepest of difficult moments. People will disagree with you. It's okay. It doesn't change how you treat them. It doesn't change how you act. In my marriage, my wife gets to be a recipient of my walk with the Lord. If I mistreat her, it's because I am not having my walk with the Lord right. Period. Colossians 3.23, everything I do is under the Lord, not under man. It's a worship to him. If you and I disagree on something, the way I treat you, you are, you are a recipient of my love for Christ. Period. Believe me, Christopher wants to do mean things to you. <laughs> It's true. I'm Lebanese. I'm a terrorist lover. Lebanese and Italian. Dude, we can go crazy. We have, you know, awesome things we could do. Let's keep reading. But love your enemies. Do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High because he is kind and grateful and ungrateful. Because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. Now let's get to this other part. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. 
Forgive and you'll be forgiven. Give and it'll be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, and will be poured in, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it'll be measured to you. Does this word generous sound important yet? Yes. It's a litmus test, guys. That's why I want you to write it on your bathroom mirror. I want you to have it somewhere where you say, am I generous? Am I gonna be generous today? And then you walk out of your door and all of a sudden your child will say something. You're like, generous, I'm gonna be generous. (laughs) You're gonna get to work. You're gonna be driving to work. Uh, I get those complaints a lot of people driving. I challenge you to read through the Bible looking for generosity, how it applies to this conversation. The woman caught in adultery. Jesus at the end, you know, the only one that could have thrown a stone at her was Jesus himself. Everyone else left, and he was generous. The good Samaritans separating the sheep from the goats, and he says, the least you've done, to the least of these you've done unto me. Generosity, generosity, caring for widows and orphans. That's important. Does generosity require you to have a lot of something? No. You just take what you have and you're willing to give it. So believe me, this is a this is a mistake we make. There are people who choose to tithe when they think they have enough money to tithe. There are people who give out of their time when they think they have extra time to give. That is not generosity. That's you doing with some kind of guilt issue and you're doing it for the, for the wrong reason. Again, write your letters to Dan. <laughs> I love it. It's all good. But I'm, I'm saying this. Stop and seek God. Submit to him. And when you do, all these other things line up. <clears throat> There's so many scriptures I could read through. I want to read one more, and then we're going to watch a video and come to communion. Now, this is not up there, so he's got to listen, so I apologize. I didn't put it up there. I didn't know I was going to read it. But 2 Corinthians 9, so I'll write it down somewhere and try to remember it. Verse 11, you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have approved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his incredible gift. One of your most generous gifts you can bring to the table is your personal testimony of Christ. Your eyewitness of Christ. When you bring that to the table, it puts things in line. This battle, it's real. Flesh and spirit would... I'm telling you, if you are struggling with forgiveness, go back into your prayer closet. (laughs) If you are struggling with being generous in these kind of things, go back and check on the submission scale and say, God, am I really submitted to you? Again, this is not for anybody else to judge. I'm not gonna walk around and ask you, but I'm telling you, I deal with this. You wonder what I deal with? This is my walk with God. What we just talked about is the struggle that I have all the time. And, and, and when I fail and I fail, I go back and say, oh, Lord, I can't believe Christopher showed up again. Let's have some more one-on-one time. I need a little more Jesus coming out of me. Amen. We're going to watch a, a quick uh, clip from Chosen, and then we'll talk about it and be done. Go ahead. Not to spoil this beautiful day or anything, huh? <laughs> Come on. Ah! Huh? It's a leper. Stay back. Cover your mouth. Don't breathe his air. Don't come any closer. It's okay, John. It's okay. Rabbi, 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 you cannot. It's disease. You. Can't. 
please. Please. Please don't turn away from me. I won't. Lord, if you are willing, if you can make me clean. Only if you want to, I submit to you. My sister, she was a servant at the wedding. She told me what you could do. I know you can heal me if you are willing. I am willing. <laughs> Thank you. I, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. What can I, what can I ever do? No, no. Do not say anything to anyone. You don't seek your own honor? Please just do me this one thing. But what do I tell people? Go, show yourself to the priest. Let them inspect you and see that you are cleansed. Make the proper offering in the temple as Moses commanded. And go on your way. Who has an extra tunic? Just one of you, just one of you. That's enough. Green is definitely your color. Oh. <laughs> Not too shabby. <laughs> so leprosy, like the gold that you could never pay back, was a, at that point was the disease that everyone was so scared of because they knew it meant death. And you also were Mariah. You actually couldn't even walk if the pace of anybody. They point and they yell. Is a leper. They actually had to wear a bell to make sure that people uh, knew that you came to town. So he's healed because Jesus. And I guarantee the generosity. I mean, imagine that guy go in and now treat another leper's bedroom, right? It's interesting today, St. Patrick's Day, and I just want to give one a quick bit of history. St. Patrick's is actually. He wasn't Irish, he was British. I don't know if you know that or not. I think it's funny if you know. Some some Irish people don't even know that. <laughs> if they did, they might not like it as much, I don't know. But he was a 15-year-old boy that actually um, was caught as a prisoner and sold as a slave to the Irish, to a man that was not very kind to him. He escaped when he was 22 years old. During that time, he gave his life to Christ. He escaped, he went back to Britain. And while he was there serving the Lord, the Lord told him, I want you to go back to the people, to Ireland. That's what he did. I didn't know, I really didn't even think twice about that it was St. Patrick's Day, except I think it's a great example of a reminder of what it means to be generous to your enemies. I mean. I don't know about you, do you want to go back to the country who enslaved you? I don't think so. But this guy understood that. When Jesus said go, he went. And he's known as someone who lived out a practical life of living for Christ, for everybody. Now we're gonna to come to communion and here's the key point for the takeaway, not just the litmus test, 
But if there's something standing in your way of that generosity, if there's something, if it's pride, if it's hate, if it's anger, if it's unforgiveness, if it's any of those things, he said, I'm not going to ask you to get up and tell me about them. I'm going to ask you to bring it to community. This is where it happens. And, and come and, and take a minute and say, Lord, I give this to you. Now, here's the thing about forgiveness. This is crucial. Some people think we forgive and it happens like I forgive somebody and it's over. That's actually not how forgiveness happens. Now, God does that. We don't. I actually forgive things in my life that happened to me years ago. Because sometimes I wake up mad again about something happened 10 years ago. Anybody else do that? And then we think man, we're mad at ourselves. Like, I can't believe I thought I forgave that. You did. But you're human and you got mad again today. So guess what you're getting to today again? Forgive. My wife has forgiven me a hundred times, I guarantee it, for one song I did back in the day. And I forgive her. Those we love are the closest to us. But forgiveness is a crucial element to this. But be, be genuine, but also be generous. I mean, I really try to live a life, and I tell you this, in my marriage, with my kids, with my friends, that I've already forgiven you. Now, that sounds weird. But the reason why I do that is because Jesus told me to. But, but beyond that, it also is because I think it helps me. I know that you're going to be human. I know that you're not going to always say the right thing. So I don't walk in offense. I'm not waiting for you to fail. <laughs> I hope you're not waiting for me to fail. It's going to happen. Stay out with me for a day. You'll be like, that. can't believe that guy. You let him do anything. We're human. And I try to live for Christ, but we show up. So if you come to communion, I'm going to ask you to take the bread, take the cup. What this represents, if you're new here or don't know the Lord, is this is his body that was broken for you. And he was sitting with all his disciples and he said, I want you to remember this. Now, why does he care so much that you, you remember this? Is because we're human and we do what? We forget so often. And then this represents his blood that was poured out for us. It washes our sin. This represents the holiness we're talking about. The wretched man that we are. And he makes us whole. Now, if we understand communion, now we get to walk in that generosity. But I challenge you, if there's something in the way, our prayer team, if you come up during this song, uh, come up and get prayer. Don't do it alone. One thing I hope you caught is everyone kept raising their hand. It means they're just like you. We're human. We need Jesus in our life. We fail. I tell you what, living genuine, living that generous life, oh, it's an incredible battle. It's an incredible thing, but I tell you what, it's so fun to do. I guarantee if you found, how many of some of the, you know, if you walked into work, they know that you're their enemy. Just be honest. Okay, come on, Richard. I know, I know. Or maybe in your family, or maybe in life. Imagine you going and treating them like they were Jesus. No, you broke the YouTube. Remember. It just healed you from leprosy. They're a recipient of the amazing blessing you received. That's how we get to live.